Gary Kurtz, shown here with directors Jim Henson and Frank Oz, was a producer and the second unit director of The Dark Crystal. And earlier this week, his family put out this statement, quote, with deep love and respect, the family of Gary Kurtz is sad to share that he has passed away. He died from cancer on September 23, 2018 in North London, England. Gary was a beloved husband, father, grandfather, friend, colleague, and mentor, whose work and talent spanned filmmaking, photography, music, and cinema history. He was a marine, a world traveler, an outdoorsman, and a kind, compassionate human being. His life's work was to share the wonder of audiovisual storytelling through the art of film. Well known for his work as the producer of American Graffiti, Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, and The Dark Crystal, Gary was passionate about telling stories that shared the humanity of characters in entertaining ways for audiences around the world. Gary was a magnificent man who will be hugely missed. His whole family thanks you for your loving thoughts. End quote. He indeed will be hugely missed, and as I look back on my childhood, it was films like the ones that he was involved in that really captivated me to the point that I still love them well into my mid-thirties. So remembering Gary Kurtz is what we'll be doing today on The Dark Crystal Conjunction. There is so much to say about him, but we'll keep our episode today to the scope of his work on The Dark Crystal, which I would trace back to Yoda, the Star Wars character. Jim Henson's single-line journal that he kept, his May 20th, 1980 entry read, quote, Empire Strikes Back opens in London. Yoda, a big hit, end quote. Henson's The Red Book site explains, quote, Jim took special pleasure in the success of Yoda from George Lucas's Star Wars franchise because his team had a part in his creation, and Frank Oz, Jim's longtime colleague, performed the character. Stuart Freeborn, who was pioneering the use of latex in makeup and effects and was supervising that area for The Empire Strikes Back, was known to Jim through makeup and effects guru Dick Smith. Jim was seeking information about the use of latex for The Dark Crystal, and at the same time, producer Gary Kurtz, who was working with George Lucas, reached out to Jim regarding puppet making. Kurtz discussed the joint work with the Fantastic Films magazine. He said, quote, During the preparation for Empire, I went to see Jim Henson about some assistance for a creature we were developing. That creature, of course, was Yoda. Jim had been working for many years on an idea for an all-fantasy adventure, using all mechanical creatures. Because Yoda was along the idea of this work, he thought it would be a good experiment. He offered a tremendous amount of assistance. Frank Oz and other members of Henson's staff actually did the performing of Yoda, and they offered their expertise to Stuart Freeborn, who was the makeup and creature supervisor for the development of Yoda. That technology went back into the Dark Crystal." End quote. In Cassian Gaines' book, Jim Henson's The Dark Crystal, The Ultimate Visual History, it talks about the team that Henson was building for his experimental epic fantasy. It reads, quote, In September 1979, Gary Kurtz was officially brought in to co-produce The Dark Crystal, having left behind the Star Wars franchise after Empire Strikes Back. Gary was the movie person, says Duncan Kendworthy, associate producer for the Henson organization during production. He was the one that knew his way around the industry in the United Kingdom a bit, even though he was an American, but he had made movies there. Gary would be in all the meetings and was a steady hand behind Jim. On several occasions, I heard him tell Jim, maybe you should rethink that, end quote. One such instance of him telling Jim something like that was when it came to the main characters, the Gelflings. The Gelflings, I suppose, are basically our, our hero and heroine. They are the ones that we identify with. They take us through the film. The Gelflings, I, I really feel, were the hardest of the characters to uh, design in that they, we had decided they were, should be the most human. They are kind of our bridge characters, the characters through which the audience enters this world. And so as such, there were many different ways we could go, many different options. I started by sculpting tiny heads in plasticine, and I worked very quickly, so i just keep sculpting them and turning them out. And, um, you know, Jim and Brian would come by and say, Yes, well, I like that, but change the eyes, change the mouth. And um, we went through a whole series of developments from a very animal-like face for each of them to uh, a much more human face. And it was very difficult to get a female animal-like creature to look pretty enough. So we developed away from that and um, 
finally, it seemed like after years of this, I did get uh, two heads, and Jim and Frank and Brian came to look at them, and um, they finally said, yes, I think, I think that's it. I think those will be the Gelflings. Seeing that short clip, plus a lot of the behind-the-scenes photos, you indeed discovered that there were many, many of iterations of the Gelflings. Even after the group was finally satisfied with the look of the Gelflings, there were still several other key members of the team that thought audiences would reject them due to how uncanny they looked, even arguing for human actors instead. Duncan Kenworthy being one of them, and even Gary Kurtz, again from the Ultimate Visual History, quote, That was one of the biggest discussions that we had early on, Gary Kurtz says. When I first got the script and saw some of the artwork and things, I asked if it would be better if these two characters, Jen and Kara, were human in a world of otherwise epic creature characters. That discussion went on for a while, but my take is that Jim ultimately wanted this film to be an experiment in what would happen if we did a film with no human beings. It's hard to make that work dramatically. He wanted to be able to promote the film as an all-creature film, but once the movie was released, a lot of the critics said Jen and Kira were the weakest characters." End quote. Interestingly enough, even in modern reviews I hear that same criticism, even from folks who adore the movie, even though they perceive this as one of its weaknesses. Jumping forward to 1981, reread, quote, While Jim continued work on The Great Muppet Caper, Gary Kurtz supervised the storyboarding for The Dark Crystal, an essential method of preparing for what was anticipated to be a complicated shoot. We knew from the very beginning that the creatures were going to be limited in what they could do, Kurt says, so every sequence had to be carefully storyboarded. The storyboard artists were not concerned with the limitations of the creatures. They just drew each scene out as if human actors were doing everything. Then, when we put them all up on the wall, we could decipher certain things that could not be done and would have to be shot in a different way to hide things. We would redraw those storyboards so that we ended up with a shot-for-shot -shot sequence." End quote. They did end up with several thousand storyboards, which was unheard of for a film as short as 93 minutes. With years of work, the film was nearly ready for principal photography, but first the team would bring in some more experimentation with the light flex. Check out what they say about it in the film documentary, The World of the Dark Crystal. We were very fortunate that we were able to talk Ozzy Morris into to shooting this film. It's, it's his last film before he retires. He's one of the great cinematographers in England. Ozzy was shooting all of the footage through a light flex, which was a unit that sits on the front of the camera, and it gives a, a faint color tint to each scene. Ask him again. Steve, is that switched on? It was Ozzy's feeling that he was trying to create a sense of magic, a sense of fairy tale, by giving it that sort of overall color wash he felt it would look more like Brian's original paintings. Gary Kurtz, in his last recorded video interview on The Dark Crystal from 2014, talks about this process as well. Brian had done several books, um, The Goblins and other books that uh, were in a style that Jim liked. And uh, so he brought his own take on how the characters should look. And he was in and out of the shop for quite a while, um, several years. And when we got closer to starting to shoot, um, Brian helped decide how the look of the film would be in terms of the color washes that we wanted to use for certain sequences. We had color filters that we photographed through, so some of the sequences had a slightly uh, purple feel and some had a slightly blue or green feel. It's pretty subtle, and so especially now when the, with the digital regrading you probably can't see it much anymore because it's, it's pretty pretty much washed out but in the film prints you could see it though he sounds okay with it now before shooting we read this in the ultimate visual history quote but gary kurtz was wary early on that the light flex might make the dark crystal appear too much like brian froud's artwork which froud describes as having a muted color palette when the crew watched the first day of rushes featuring the Uru in Mystic Valley, their outdoor village located among sand and stone, Gary Kurtz expressed concern that the creatures were blending in too much with the landscape. The mystic skin was close to the environmental elements that adorned the soundstage, and the light flexes filtering was exasperating the issue, creating an almost monochromatic look. When Kurtz brought this up with Ryan Froud, he was told that there was no cause for concern for Froud. This was the exact look for the scene that he had always dreamed about." End quote. 
I love hearing these behind the scenes disagreements because we know people weren't afraid to express their opinions on this team. And even with the concerns they raised, they could continue to work well together and make wonderful art. Read or watch any interview with those who worked with Jim Henson and you'll hear over and over again that he was a true collaborator and encouraged people to express their concerns and ideas because he wanted the work that they were doing together to be the best that it could be. And he was humble enough to recognize that others could have great ideas as well. But I digress. Back to more behind the scenes with Gary Kurtz. Quote, Principal Photography began on April 15th, 1981 at EMI L Street Studios on Stage 4 with the scene at Mystic Valley, which, to paraphrase one of Augur's lines in the film, marked a simultaneous ending and beginning of a long process. The magic of the movie for me was that after all the rehearsal time and all those years of development, I got to see the characters come alive on the screen and have the film crew relate to them as if they were real, Gary Kurtz says. In between takes, they would talk to them as their characters. They came alive because of the diligent rehearsal of the performers who had worked on it for so long." End quote. As we see in the movie credits, Kurtz wasn't just one of the producers, but also the second unit director. Again from the Ultimate Visual History, quote, While Henson and Oz were shooting principal photography, Gary Kurtz directed the second unit. Some of the Gelfling scenes fell under his jurisdiction, but Kurt's most significant directorial moment came with the fight between the Landstriders and the Gartham. That was shot outside on the studio back lot, he says. I did some storyboard sketches and talked with Jim and Frank about it, but other than that, it was an ad-lib sequence. There's no dialogue, so it was just whatever shots looked good. Nevertheless, putting the sequence together was not easy. The Landstrider sequence required a lot of movie magic, as they were carefully edited to conceal the various ways in which each shot was composed. Furthermore, among all the creatures in the film, the Landstriders were the most dangerous to perform. They required a lot of rehearsal, Kurtz continues. We were worried that someone might get hurt since they were so high. We used an emergency wire for support in some shots, but the performers weren't worried, so we didn't use it all the time. The safety wires were actually a pain in the neck to use. This was in the pre-digital era, so we couldn't paint the wires out. We had to hide them and try to blend them in with the sky. Luckily, no one fell over, and there were no accidents." End quote. In our last video on Trevor Jones' contribution to The Dark Crystal, we talked about how the film's score took a drastically different direction, thanks to Gary Kurtz. The music was going to be very experimental, but Kurtz didn't want the strange creatures coupled with strange music to grate the audience. That may have been too much. And thanks to his input, what we have, in my opinion, is one of the greatest film soundtracks of all time. And it is a soundtrack that helps to get the emotion out of the film that is made up of all creature puppets. Henson originally wanted to keep the experimentation going by having the Skeksi speak a language that would be unknown to any of us. At test screenings, it turned out that that was indeed too jarring for audiences. Kurtz explains in this interview. Um, originally, we had, we had the idea that the Skeksis would um, speak a funny, odd language. We actually had an expert in to, um, um, to come up with a language that was uh, weird enough so that it couldn't be mistaken for any real language anywhere in the world. So it was a variation on a kind of ancient Egyptian and uh, a couple of other uh, languages um, thrown in from pre-biblical times. And the Skeksis spoke in this funny language. Uh, and we weren't going to subtitle it because we felt that the, the, uh, the audience would get a pretty good idea of what was going on just by looking at the pictures. Well, I mean, that was a, a, a bit of intellectual conceit on our part because um, a lot of people came back and said, what the hell are they talking about? You need to, <laughs> need to subtitle it. So rather than subtitle it, we decided we'd have them speak in English. Uh, they don't say a lot, but, but it's just an, a few words. And you don't want the audience to feel like they're missing out on, on major chunks of exposition. 
Well, as we now know, the film became a cult classic and won Best Fantasy Film at the Saturn Awards, organized by the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films, where it was also nominated for Best Special Effects and Best Poster Art. Gary Kurtz, along with Henson, Oz, and Odell, also got a nomination for Best Dramatic Presentation at the prestigious Hugo Awards, which honors the best in science fiction and fantasy works. As you can see, Gary Kurtz wore many hats while on the Dark Crystal team, and this was a pattern you see in all his other work as well. I do believe this film wouldn't be what it is today without the passion of Gary Kurtz. He will be missed. In closing, allow me to encourage you to listen to this 25-minute interview with Gary Kurtz that took place in 2014 before a Dark Crystal screening. He talks more about some behind the scenes and even his views on a sequel and the use of CGI. So enjoy that, and until next time, keep exploring Thra and remembering those who brought it to life. Oh.